we're a little early, but I'll go through the introductions. So we've got Sarah Young, who I believe you are a princess of Azure security. Is that correct? Yeah, totally. It is my official job title. That um, is your official job title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. need to get a new job title. Um, James, if you're listening, I would like that as... No, I don't want that as my job title. I'll have Prince, though. Um, so let me bring up my little guide. You realize now your job title is going to be Princess. It's on YouTube for all to see. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think your mic's completely in, Shanna, or I'm just going... Oh, no, hang on. Ignore me. My headphones are broken. Ignore me. Uh, Sarah Herbie, that's all right. We're just talking about you. Talking about me is fine. Yeah. I'm a horrible person. Okay. Sarah is the self-titled princess of Microsoft Azure Security, allegedly lives in Melbourne, uh, but is most likely to be found in airport lounges across Asia, but obviously not at the moment. I know the, uh, the Changi Airport Lounge, when I went through it three weeks ago, was very deserted of people. <laughs> yeah. um, Sarah loves cloud security and spends most of her time telling people how to do it better and generally nerding. Well, we definitely appreciate that over here. So I, without further ado, I will hand over to you, Sarah. Cool. Thank you. And thanks everyone um, who's watching. I hope you're all safe and well. Um, I'm currently, as I said, I allegedly live in Melbourne. I'm actually currently in Wellington. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> not even in my home country right now. So, um, or why say home country? Actually, Australia is not my home country. You can probably tell by the accent, but let me share my screen and hopefully all this stuff will work. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Sarah Young. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about hacking VoIP. Um, I used to be, for background, I used to be a network engineer. I used to do a lot of VoIP work, so much VoIP work. I've deployed hundreds of thousands of telephones, um, mostly across Europe. And so uh, since I transitioned into security about six, seven years ago, um, it's always been something I wanted to revisit, which is, um, I finally got to do it with this talk. So we're going to talk about hacking VoIP. So um, I actually thought it would be really fun to use the design suggestions on PowerPoint for the for all these slides. So if it's kind of burning your eyes, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I, I've just never really used the design ideas on PowerPoint. So I decided that the next time I did a talk, I would try and uh, try and do it uh, using the design ideas just to see see how it came out. So I'm going to blame that if you don't like my slides. Um, real quick, who am I? Um, I'm an Azure security architect. Uh, I was nicknamed the princess of Azure security by some of my teammates in Hong Kong. It's kind of stuck with some people. Um, um, I live in Melbourne. Um, oh, I did do this. I meant to take that out. I'm pretty sure everybody here knows who Melbourne is. I did do this talk in America, which is why I have that colder and wetter bit of Australia. Um, I really love dogs. That is not my dog, sadly. It's my parents' dog because I can't have a dog because I live in a very small apartment and travel too much, or at least I used to. <laughs> um, I used to be a VoIP engineer and now I do cloud security stuff. I am a prolific user of GIFs and memes in my presentations. If you've ever seen anything I've done before, it will be full of them. Um, I think that my GIF and meme game in this particular topic is not as strong. And that's largely because there's not that many about telephones that are relevant, but you know, bear with me. I, I've still got enough in, I think. Um, I did, again, I should have, I should have, I meant to do something, I meant to put, I live in Melbourne, and there's Melbourne, but I'm actually in Wellington, and I think I have accidentally deleted it. Yeah, I did. Oh, well. So, um, what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about a brief history of phone hacking before VoIP, because of course, VoIP, voice over IP, did, um, you know, is a uh, normal telephones and normal telephone technology are still around, and they were a precursor to VoIP. Uh, we're going to recap very quickly the basic principles, uh, the basic tech principles of a VoIP system. So um, if you've never worked with it before, um, it's just useful to understand some of the concepts just before we talk about how you would, uh, how you would hack it. Um, and then we'll have a look at some of the common attack vectors for VoIP. So let's crack on. Now, I really hope this will work and comes through on the Zoom. So if anyone's watching and it doesn't, tell me. I'm sure you thought you were going to be watching uh, <laughs> uh, clips from movies during during the stream.
uh, Goose Island, Oregon, please. The number for Dr. Robert Hume, H-U-M-E, on Tall Cedar Road. Checking on Dr. Robert Hume, H-U-M-E, on Tall Cedar Road. I find no listing. What does that mean? He doesn't have a phone? I'm sorry, I have no listing. Oh, wait, uh, Falcon. Dr. Stephen Falcon, F-A-L-K-E-N, at the same address. I find no listing for Dr. Stephen Falcon, F-A-L-K-E-N, on Tall Cedar Road, Goose Island. Thank you. Right, now, someone just messaged me and said that there was no sound on that, so sorry if you didn't hear any sound. Um, I was, I hoped this would work, but I wasn't too sure. Anyway, um, if you didn't, if you couldn't hear that and you've never seen that clip before, of course, that's from War Games. Um, and that is our classic uh, VoIP or phone, phone hacking technique or how most people perceive it to be. Um, now, interestingly, um, I, and I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. Interestingly, um, that clip uh, where Matthew Broderick um, sort of uh, trips uh, the phone to get a dial tone. That, um, of course, War Games is from the 80s. Uh, that wouldn't have been possible to do on a phone in the 80s. It actually, you haven't been able to do that sort of stuff since the 60s uh, because uh, dial tone now was, uh, as you know, when you pick up a phone, dial tone is there by default. And the reason for that is because um, it's so people can call the emergency services. It was actually changed for that precise reason. So you don't need to get a dial tone in the same way anymore. Anyway, um, there's a lot of, if, if you go and look that up and you want to listen to that clip with sound, if you couldn't hear it, then, and my apologies, um, there wasn't a way to test whether this would work through the live stream beforehand. I was just kind of hoping it would. Um, if you listen to that, if you look up that clip and have a look at it, um, there's loads of um, real hardcore phone nerds actually explaining in depth why that won't work in the 80s. But anyway, that was just to give you an idea of what we typically know as classic kind of phone hacking. Um, but let's look at the history. So in fact, the first ever hack um, of any uh, telephone technology was in 1903. It was well over 100 years ago. And it was done by a magician. His name was Neville Maskelyne. Um, now, what he did was he was hacking Marconi's wireless service. Um, and he did it with this very, very basic antenna and was sender, sending um, funny messages through uh, the wireless. Um, he was saying things like um, just rats, 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 which Hey, it was a hundred years ago, okay? Um, and he was saying little uh, uh, little ditties and little poems that were sort of bad-mouthing Marconi. Um, obviously, Marconi wasn't very happy and it kind of showed him up at his big public event where he was demonstrating the wireless. Um, four days later, he actually wrote into the Times and confessed to what he'd done. Um, and his, his justification for doing it was that um, he was showing that the wireless actually had security vulnerabilities that it could be hacked because one of Marconi's claims was that um, no one could intercept it. It was it was absolutely secure. You could have privacy. So that might sound a little bit familiar, um, but 100 years ago. So um, yeah, humans don't change. So it seems. So this was the chap Neville. Um, it also transpired um, that he was, oh, I've got clicked over a slide. It also transpired he was actually paid to do this by um, a rival telegraph company who weren't using wireless technology. They'd actually paid him to do it. So uh, yeah, again, people don't change. Um, the next one I'm gonna move on to is um, phone freaking. Now, I'm skipping over what happened in the Second World War um, and and because arguably we could talk here about the Enigma machine and how uh, that was decoded, etc. The signals were decoded, but I think a lot of, that's been covered quite extensively and I'm sure most people have seen something about that. So I'm going to move on just to talk about phone, um, phone freaking, which started in the 1950s. Um, the term freak comes from phone, free and freak. Um, Freaking, um, it began when people could, um, when you used to have your dial tone and the phone tone all in one signal, um, then you could send certain frequencies down the phone line that would match the dial tone. And you could essentially dial numbers for free and trick the phone system into thinking that, um, that if it was a pay phone that you paid, et cetera. Um, Essentially, freakers usually use this for make free phone calls. Um, it was possible to do some eavesdropping as well, but 
And as you can see, as I said, um, my GIF and meme game is slightly weaker because there's not that many things with the telephone, but here's Barney with a very big telephone. So there you go. Um, some fun facts about freaking. Um, there are some people who can actually whistle in a perfect uh, uh, 2,600 megahertz pitch. Um, uh, one freaker who was quite famous called John Draper discovered that a whistle that was distributed in Captain Crunch cereal in the US actually emitted a perfect pitch. And so he used that extensively for uh, phone freaking. And then there is a picture of said whistle, uh, which is just a complete coincidence. Uh, this is the first thing I actually learned about phone freaking was uh, blue boxes. Blue boxes uh, were created specifically to do uh, phone freaking. And that's the first time I'd ever heard of it when I came across a blue box. I think it was at KiwiCon. It was definitely at a security conference um, a number of years ago. Some famous freakers are Steve Jobs and, and Woz. Um, they did that at college. Um, it did stop largely in the 1980s when dial tones were taken out of bands. So they didn't sit in the, in the main voice stream. And that actually stopped because you couldn't in, and that stopped freaking largely because in order to input the, um, because um, in, in band meant that both the, uh, the voice signal, your actual speech and the dial tones and the different tones were all together. When the dial tones, when the control tones were taken out of band, it meant that just by whistling down the phone, it wasn't in the same stream. So that's what stopped it largely in the 1980s. Um, this is a very short clip. I know um, I, it's basically um, a very famous guy called Joe Ingressia. Um, he could he could actually whistle. He was a blind man in the States who could whistle at a perfect pitch to do phone freaking. Now, it's a pretty short clip. Uh, I don't know if anyone can hear it. Um, and I know the point of this is that you can hear it. So sorry if you can't. Um, I'll play it and hope maybe people can hear it. Um, <laughs> If you can't, um, do go and look this up on YouTube and listen to it yourself because it's really, really cool. Like blind phone freak Joe and Grecia, you could whistle calls through the network. Let's see if I make it this time. This is really hard to do. It sounded like all the tones were present, so the phone should be ringing a bell now. Okay, it hit the phone. It just takes a little while. He even showed off his skills for the local media. Now there's one phone to a town in Illinois and back to. So there you go. It's a pretty good party trick if you can manage it. And um, of course, as I said, it doesn't really work anymore. But if you can find some old phones and make your own little phone network uh, into, that doesn't hit the normal PSTN, who knows? You might be able to do it. Oh, I do not want that to start again. So let's just have a quick look at VoIP and how VoIP works. So if you've never worked with it before, of course, VoIP is voice over IP. It is, um, it's, so everything's done over TCP IP. So um, just to give you a really um, basic call flow for um, a VoIP phone calling another VoIP phone. Uh, VoIP phones are pretty dumb. They actually don't know how to do anything by themselves. So when uh, someone makes a call on a VoIP phone, it will signal up to um, its call manager. Now, I've called it call manager because that's the name of the Cisco product that I used to work with a lot, but you can call it any kind of, it, sometimes people call them PBXs, but not really PBXs, um, or any kind of other centralized VoIP server, just I call it, call it call manager. So the IP phone will talk to the call manager server and it will say, hey, um, this person has dialed this number and what do I do with it? The call manager server will signal back and it will say, okay, that number is actually uh, actually corresponds to this IP address um, if it's an internal phone that's on the system. So it's a little bit like DNS in a way. It's essentially doing, um, it's actually resolving things. So the call manager server will tell the IP phone, this is the IP you need to send the voice stream to. And then the voice stream will go to the other IP phone. So at no time, and then of course, um, the other IP phone will return it, its side of the voice stream. And that makes a two-way call. So you can see here at no time, does the voice stream actually go up to the management server? It doesn't go through there at all. All the management server does is signal and tell the phones what to do. And that's really important to understand because that's different to how traditional telephony networks 
work. In traditional telephony networks, everything would go through all the different switches. Um, whereas it's tried to be rationalized a bit here to minimize the number of hops. And then, so looking at just a slightly different scenario, um, this is how you, um, you would call a phone that was outside your VoIP network. So, you know, normally you would have a VoIP network within a company, right? So uh, if someone tries to call a number, as usual, the IP phone will ask the call manager, it will say, hey, this phone number, where is it? Now the call manager will know if that number is not inside its uh, system. And the call manager will have rules in it that says this, if this is not, if this number is not found internally, you need to send it to a gateway. And the gateways are, um, or it's labeled as a router there. Um, essentially voice gateways are routers with special cards in them. Um, at least they used to be. Now they don't even have special cards. It's more about licensing because we just use SIP trunks usually. Um, so the call manager will tell the, uh, the IP phone, it will give it the gateway's address. So the stream will go to the gateway. The gateway is connected in some way, shape or form, either through traditional VoIP technologies or um, VoIP, traditional telephone technologies or using things like SIP, so modern um, IP based protocols. And then it will send that into the phone network, the wider phone network, which we call the PSTN, the public switch telephone network. Um, you, um, so that would be like a Telstra or Spark or whoever it is. And then the call goes between there, all of those different things. Also, I should mention um, the router or the voice gateway does actually also talk to the call manager because it doesn't know what to do with things either. So it, when it receives calls inbound uh, from the PSTN, it will say, hello, I have a call on this number, which IP address do I send it to? So, you know, the call manager um, server is in charge, but no calls go through it. It's always, um, it's important to understand that bit. So there's your VoIP 101 if, if you've never worked with it before. So um, here are some vo VoIP providers we have known and loved over the years. Um, I have worked with and replaced quite a number of them. Um, of course, nowadays we are starting to move away from, uh, we, we are moving away a bit from having physical phones on our desks. I mean, a lot of us will just now use um, a soft client on our machine. You know, you might be using Slack, Teams, Zoom, but this has still got VoIP technology built into the back of it. So even if you don't have a physical phone and you're not using one of these big, uh, the big uh, VoIP players, I can guarantee you are using VoIP somewhere. So. And so finally, let's have a look at some of the common attack vectors for VoIP, uh, which is the whole point of what I, uh, this talk. Um, the first one is a classic uh, VoIP attack of VLAN hopping. So um, that is when um, normally when you have an access port, uh, a physical access port, so we're not talking wireless here, um, you will have configured on that access port a data VLAN and a voice VLAN. So your voice traffic will be separated into the voice VLAN and everything else goes into your access VLAN. So if you connect a laptop to a, a uh, network port, um, and you can then um, you can pop between the VLANs. And if you can get onto the voice VLAN, you can effectively then sit there and eavesdrop and listen to all the VoIP traffic. Um, it's incredibly easy to do, uh, incredibly easy. And I'm going to talk about it um, on another slide. A lot of VoIP protocols by default are often in the clear. So essentially, you put um, a Wireshark on, and you know, you've got a VoIP stream. Um, so um, again, like I said, um, this is my eavesdropping, very easy way to eavesdrop. I've done it um, in pieces of work before. Um, the mitigations for this are things like, is, is to the mitigations are all around physical, actually stopping people physically accessing the port to be able to do this. So, I mean, tamper-proof cables is a good way of doing it. Hard coding MAC addresses. Now I have to say, it is a mitigation for this particular attack. I personally am not a huge fan of hard coding MAC addresses for various other reasons, but so so nobody pull me apart on, on Slack. I actually don't love hard coding MAC addresses, but it, it does mitigate this particular attack. Um, and of course, firewalling off any phones or ports that are in public areas where people could get into them um, and physically plug themselves in. They're essentially how you can uh, how you can stop that. Um, so now we look at DDoS again. We're going, of course, we're going through all the classic network attacks with a bit of a VoIP slant. Um, 
DDoS for VoIP is also known as TDOS, so telephony denial of service. Um, it's essentially the same kind of principle in that any, um, it, it's basically about overwhelming um, a VoIP service so it can't process requests and it can't function. Um, some quite notorious ones were in 2016, this um, iOS bug bounty hunter, he was really new, uh, managed to teed off the, nine, the 911 service in several cities in the US um, because he was just looking for a bug in iOS because we know that Apple pay big bucks for um, for their bug bounties. And um, what he was doing was the, the he was the, the phone was getting stuck in a loop calling 911. He didn't actually realize it was doing that. Um, but of course, um, because he was running this test again and again and again, he basically overwhelmed 911, which is obviously not good, uh, being that it's the emergency services. Um, the other, uh, the other good weak point from a, a TDOSing perspective is DNS servers because VoIP do need that to resolve things, as, as many network things do. Um, and of course, there's also um, war dialing uh, where you get machines and it basically calls numbers time and time and time again. Um, again, you should go and watch war games if you haven't seen that. Uh, again, um, I couldn't find anything for DDoS, surprisingly, so I just went for overflowing beer because, um, you know, we're overwhelming things. Um, one of the things that I think when I was researching this, um, one of the things that was really, really, I think, sad about the TDOSing the 911 service was that afterwards there are a lot of copycat attacks. So this this gentleman genuinely didn't mean to, to um, TDOS 911, but afterwards there are a lot of copycat attacks and I, I don't want to know what kind of strange people want to um, mess around with the emergency services, but you know, there are some strange folks out there. Um, so this is VoIP protocols. I said I'd come back to this. Um, there's not much to say apart from VoIP protocols are split into two types, the signaling and then there's the actual voice traffic, the, the protocols that actually carry the voice traffic. Um, and most of them are by default in the clear. Um, so um, there's only one, one appropriate gift here, which is of course shame. I mean, bear in mind, a lot of these are older protocols and they were written when um, having, a, um, ha having things um, encrypted by default was not normal, of course, there are secure versions of at least some of these, um, but I know that it can be a pain. Some of them, there isn't a secure version and you effectively have to VPN, you have to put them in some kind of tunnel, which can be a pain. Um, and a lot of people don't bother because it's too much hassle. So um, sadly, so um, that's, and of course, um, then if you manage to get somebody onto your network, um, eavesdropping when something's in the clear is really, really easy. Um, it's becoming easier now with with soft clients uh, because usually it requires loading on certificates and I can tell you from, I can speak from experience telling you that loading certificates onto physical phones can be a real pain but now we're, but that was sort of five six years ago now it's become much easier to to mitigate this depending on what you're using toll fraud this is kind of a successor to freaking um toll fraud and if there's anybody from any of these countries on on the stream i do apologize to you in advance um the top five countries to call using toll fraud at the moment are apparently cuba somalia bosnia and herzegovina estonia and latvia so um that's apparently what they are at the moment i can tell you when i was doing a lot of VoIP work we also used to preemptively ban pakistan and nigeria because a lot of fraudulent activity happens there with telephones um in order to do uh, toll fraud um it's essentially usually um m manipulating either users or misconfiguring systems so for example if you have a public phone that um, you that can do call forward all because some people will call forward their desk phone to their mobile. But if you do call forward all to a foreign number and you allow the system to do that because you can stop that in the configurations, it basically means that someone could call from their mobile your desk phone. That desk phone could then subsequently call a foreign number, and because the leg of the call that comes from that goes to the foreign number is on the desk phone the organization will be charged for that call um so you know and and i we did see this um in with a customer i worked with a long time ago in the uk um there was a security guard who forwarded it i can't remember what country he was from um it was somewhere overseas and he put a call forward all to his 
um, to um, somewhere abroad, I assume it was his family or something, and through looking subsequently at the call logs, we could see every night between 2 and 4 a.m. he was calling somebody in another country and not paying a penny for it. So it does happen. So yeah, um, do do watch out for that because um, people can actually. It, it sounds silly that just um, scamming um, or sort of trying to effectively steal free minutes from a phone system, but it does happen really, really frequently, e even today. Um, voice phishing. Now I'm not going to talk about this too much, um, but. Um, I guess we kind of just need to acknowledge it. Of course, there's voice phishing. So that is when um, someone calls you, pretends to be support, um, pretends to be support from another company saying you've got a virus or um, I think we all know about them. Um, if there's anyone here who's never been called by a voice scammer, then you're very lucky and I need to know your secret. Um, what I really, I, I um, in my one of my old jobs when I lived in New Zealand, um, we gave out chocolate fish as part of our fishing campaign. So I just felt that was appropriate. Were we doing this in purpose? I totally would have brought chocolate fish. So um, if if you can get hold of chocolate fish, um, if you're in New Zealand and you're locked down, go buy a chocolate fish on my behalf. Um, I can't stand them anymore because I ate so many of them like three or four years ago when we did this campaign that just no. So contact centers, when you call a contact center, um, I'm putting that up just so everyone can read it as we go. Um, contact centers, when you go through that annoying menu, um, that's called IVR or interactive voice response. Um, and I know some of them are better than others, um, but think about um, maybe when you call your bank or someone who does financial services for you, you know, sometimes the um, call center person will say, I'm going to put you on hold, I'm going to put you on hold and you need to enter your PIN and then come back so you don't tell them your PIN. Um, and that sounds, oh great, that's super, that sounds super secure because I'm not telling a person. But you are still, when you do that, inputting it into an application. And so if that application doesn't handle that correctly or it's interfacing with other databases and systems isn't done properly, um, you know, there can be data in there that someone could steal. Um, and it does happen. So, um, you know, if you're if you're in a company that uses IVR, please don't forget about looking at how the IVR handles some of the sensitive data, um, because it's, you know, it is still essentially just an application in the back end. So um, it does often get overlooked. So worth bearing in mind if, if you pen test things or if you're doing security assessments. Um, SS7 hacking. So SS7 is the signaling that's used in the PSTN network. Um, so the bigger, wider phone network. It's been around a long time. It's not a new protocol, but it kind of this this technique came to prevalence um, back in 2014 when the Italian company hacking team got hacked. And it turned out that they were, if, if you're not familiar with that story, it turned out that they were creating um, specialized hacking tools that included SS7 hacking tools, and they were selling them to um, regimes with questionable human rights records. Um, and those vulnerabilities in SS7 allow for call forwarding, call recording, reading SMS, and you can track the location of your phone. So, you know, they can do a lot with it. Um, since then, um, some carriers have installed monitoring systems, um, but basically the entire phone network across the whole world uh, runs on SS7. So that's not going to change anytime soon. And this is why we say don't use SMS as part of MFA because SMS is fundamentally broken. Now, I will caveat that with if um, the only MFA you are able to use is SMS, then SMS is better than nothing. But really, you should look at other ways of doing MFA. And that's a different rant that we won't go into. But yeah, please try and avoid using MS, SMS if you have an alternative. So, cause you know, we want to avoid the hackers. And I always put this, this one in my stream. I always put this one in, in my presentation somewhere cause it's my favorite, favorite um, GIF on hacking. Um, voicemail attacks. Um, so voicemail is probably one of the worst bits of a phone system, one of the most vulnerable. Um, it's often when people are targeting voice systems, one of the th first things I'll look at. Um, voicemails always come with a pin, but it's usually a default pin. Um, Clippy is on this page for no reason at all. Um, this is when, were we in person, I would probably give you Clippy stickers. Um, um, if anyone wants them posted when New Zealand's out of lockdown, just ping me. Uh, I'll do it when I can. 
Um, and that leads on to, you may remember a number of years ago now, there was a big scandal in the UK about celebrity voicemail hacking. And I say hacking in inverted commas, um, because what actually happened was, if, if you're not aware or you don't remember, essentially a lot of celebrities and well-known figures in the UK had their voicemails hacked. Now, what exactly? What actually happened was that um, the UK phone networks didn't enforce you to change your PIN when you set up voicemail. They do now, uh, basically in response to this. So what um, journalists were doing was managing to find the phone numbers of these high profile people um, and then dialing the voicemail, getting into their voicemail um, uh, because they knew their number and then just guessing using the default pin and most of the time they were successful in getting in and being able to listen to voicemails so clearly that's a huge invasion of privacy and you know ethically morally very very bad but i think the saddest thing about all of this was there was a a, a girl who was murdered um and um the journalist managed to get hold of her number um and when the investigation was going on when they were still looking for her um some journalists managed to get into her voicemails and they listened to some of her voicemails um and that gave the police and her parents false hope that um, she was still alive because there'd been changes made to her voicemail box. And so obviously that's probably the saddest thing about all of this. Um, now, um, people did go to prison for this in the UK, and that was why the News of the World paper went bust a few years later, um, and quite rightly so. Um, but that that is the voicemail hacking um, that uh, was, you know, quite, quite prevalent a number of years ago. So why is VoIP? Um, why is this still important? I already sort of said this, I'll put the whole thing up, but VoIP technology is still around. Even if you don't have a phone on your desk, and I haven't had a phone on my desk for a number of years now, um, VoIP is still behind the scenes. It's still carrying voice because we still need that capability, even now if it's built into some kind of collaboration platform, if you're using Slack, Teams, Zoom, Hangouts, whatever. Um, so it's going to be in your current collaboration technology. So you should have a look. Um, you may want to think about incorporating this into risk assessments, pen tests, or any kind of threat modeling. Um, and definitely the SMS, you might still be using that um, in real life. Um, I know I um, still have uh, some companies that um, I am a customer of still still use SMS as, as their MFA. Um, and of course, understanding how things work is always great for, you know, hacking things hacking anything because when you know how things work if you can if you know how things work you, you you can think about how to break them so i think it's really it's something we don't talk about as much and and i'm a big fan of voip so i think we should talk about it more um here's my take a photo or i guess take a screenshot for link slide um uh there are some really cool articles um some of which um i drew on for for this but i would definitely go look at how phone freaking work by the 8-bit guy um that's a much more in-depth uh um presentation that he did um about that um look at phone freaking uh have a look at ddosing 911 that's not cool um and don't do it and yeah um that is me done. Um, thank you very much, ComfyCon. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. And um, feel free to tweet me or hit me up on Slack. I'll keep an eye on it um, if you had any questions. And yeah, thanks for listening. No worries. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think actually NIST has said don't use SMSs for, uh, for MFA now. They've actually explicitly yeah. called it out as one thing that you shouldn't do. Uh, with all the um, the people getting their SIM cards stolen and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I note that there's a lot of uh, people in the uh, the main ComfyCon channel feeling a bit old right now, uh, re remembering <laughs> a lot of the things that, uh, that the old phones provided. I saw some, oh God, I feel a bit old statements. So I think that was a really awesome talk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. A lot of nostalgia going on for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Sorry if I made anyone feel old, not the intention. It's my birthday on Thursday and I'm not feeling good about it either. So well, no, you happy should. Birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Make sure you remind us. We'll tweet about it. <laughs> yeah. No worries. <laughs> <laughs>